Greetings, everyone. Rob Chastner here, continuing in our study, study verse by verse through the Gospel of Luke. And if you're following along, we're in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. And you remember that the Jewish leadership had already made their determination that they were going to kill Jesus. Uh, and so now they're in the process of figuring out how this plan is to be implemented. One of the problems that the Jewish leadership had was that Jesus is spending the last several months of his earthly ministry uh, uh, in the region of Perea. And so he's actually outside the jurisdiction of the Jewish leadership. And you remember in our last study, the leaders are encouraging Jesus to go to Jerusalem because they wanted to get them, get him uh, into their home court, so to speak, uh, and so they could manipulate the uh, judicial system. Um, and so the difference, though, between Jesus and uh, you and me is that Jesus authentically loved his enemies. Jesus will be reaching out to these guys until the very end. Um, but um, he's, he's reaching out, uh, and, in, and a case in point now is that we find, what we find here in beginning uh, of chapter 14, verse 1, uh, Luke is doing something rather interesting here. He is going to take the next three chapters and describe a single day in the life of Jesus, and we know that this day was a Sabbath, it was a Saturday. And so uh, we begin our study with that. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles with you, I'll put the verses in the box below this video. Press pause, read verses one through six, and then press play once again. Now the Sabbath was a big deal, and not just that it was Sabbath, but also, um, in the afternoon on Saturday, uh, they would have a big meal and a chief uh, of, of Pharisees um, uh, invited Jesus over to his house. This was probably one of the most religious leaders in the community and he invited Jesus to a meal. And in this religious leader's house, there was a man suffering from what we would call uh, edemia, which is a medical term for swelling uh, body parts. Um, and we know that Luke, as a doctor, he is the only guy in the Gospels that uses this term. And this was a condition where there would be some kind of blockage in the lymphatic system. Uh, and you'd have swelling of the arms and the legs and the eyelids and the stomach. Uh, the body is not able to get rid of fluid. And so there's a breakdown in the lymphatic system. Uh, or there's a pulmonary issue. Now, it's interesting that the man uh, uh, who was in need of medical help uh, noticed the religious leaders don't really care. There's no indication that these religious guys care one bit about this guy. Now, thankfully for this guy, Jesus was there, and Jesus cares deeply for this man, so notice that he touches this guy and the guy is healed. Now Jesus puts put forth a parable uh, and we're gonna begin that in verse seven. So press pause and read verse seven and then press play once again. Now in this Pharisee's home, there were two different types of people. There were those who were invited and then there were those who, um, who were uninvited, who could stand around the perimeter of the room up against the wall, and they would quietly observe uh, the so-called rich and famous who were being invited to see how they live and to hear their conversations. Notice that Jesus is now directing the parable, not to the uninvited, but he's directing the parable to those who were invited. And these people are watching Jesus, uh, but in reality, Jesus is watching them. They are judging Jesus, but in reality, Jesus is judging them. Now, uh, what were 
what what were their, what were they doing? Uh, what was their behavior? Uh, we have to remember that in this culture where where you sit around a dining room uh, table has very little to say about uh, uh, your importance within our culture. Uh, uh, you could you could go into somebody else's house for dinner, and there's several families there. And the question you might ask the host is, "Where should I sit?" And the most and most of the time, they will answer, "You just sit anywhere." Yet in this culture, uh, I don't think I said that right before. There's a tremendous amount of importance upon where you sit at that table. Their table was in a triclinium, so it was a U-shaped three tables or three couches with uh, together uh, in a U shape, and they would sit around this triclinium, uh, and it was established uh, uh, where you sit by the importance that you have within the community. Uh, so there'd be a pecking order, and the host would sit at the end of the left side of the triclinium, and then the farther you would sit off to that uh, that U shape away from the host, the less importance that you have, and so. What likely happened was that when the dinner bell rang, uh, it was kind of like a bunch of adults uh, playing musical chairs. They were fighting and wrestling to to get um, uh, closer to the host so that they could appear to be um, more important uh, at that dinner table. All right, press pause and read verse eight and then press play once again. So it's likely uh, it's like when you're at a wedding and you sit down in the best place and the father of the bride invited the mayor and so the mayor shows up and now they come to you in front of everybody and say hey dude the mayor is sitting here you need you need to sit somewhere else you're not as important as the mayor all right press pause and read verses 9 through 11 9 through 11 and then press play once again so Jesus is encouraging these religious men to live their lives with humility, live life with a humble state of mind. As Christians, we are to be imitators of Jesus. We are to be one who's, uh, who, who is trying to duplicate the life of Jesus. Now, what did Jesus live his life? Or, or uh, you know, it says in Philippians chapter 2, he made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself a form of a servant. Uh, he was made in the likeness of man and being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above all other names. And so here we are claiming that we are imitators of the one who humbled himself and as great as he is he humbled himself all the way to the cross now here we are saying that we are jesus's followers so what should be seen in our life well humility humbleness the ones who humble themselves will be exalted in heaven and the ones who exalt themselves in this life will be humbled in heaven and so when we get to heaven, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to be exalted or you're going to be humbled. In the quietness of your own heart, one must judge yourself and judge your own heart. And uh, when you arrive at the presence of God, are you going to be exalted or are you going to be, um, are you going to be humbled? Um, all right, uh, press pause now and read verse 12 and then press play once again. So if you have your rich neighbor come over and then you give him a nice filet, likely what's going to happen is your rich neighbor doesn't want you to outdo him. And so he's going to go home and he's going to invite you back over and give you even a greater steak than, uh, than you gave him and uh, to pay you back. And now where's the sacrifice there? You give him a filet. He gave you a filet. There's no sacrifice going on with that exchange. All right, press pause, read verses 13 through 15, and then press play once again. 
<clears throat> so he turns to the Pharisee and he says, if you invite only those who can give you in return, that's what you gave him, where is your sacrifice? The Bible teaches us that we should want to give to those who are not able to give anything back. And we turn uh, when we will uh, and we will be repaid in the kingdom of God. Now, what uh, when we do that? Are we not being imitators of Jesus? You see, Jesus gave to us who are completely unable to pay him back. And how are you going to pay back Jesus for what he has done for us? So what has Jesus done? Jesus has given the unspeakable gift of eternal life, knowing that we can never, ever pay him back. And so Jesus says to this guy, that needs to be your attitude. Not to look at relationships for what you can get out of the other person, but rather what you can give to that other person without looking for anything in return whatsoever. I right, press pause and read verses 16 to 24 and then press play once again. Isn't it interesting? Here's a parable of the heavenly father who came and his uh, with his invitation to the children of Israel, the privilege, the spiritual privileged class of the world. And no matter what town or village he went to, one after the other, they they had their excuses. They had their reasons why they were not going to make Jesus their Messiah. So Israel essentially rejected their God. He came to his own, his own received him not. And so what does the father do? Does he just flush this whole group of people out of the planet? No, but rather he sends out the servants to the weak, the beggars, the downtrodden, to the likes of the, the uh, you and me, uh, who are living outside of that commonwealth of Israel. Notice the, the heart of the father. Verse 23, he says, so that my house be filled. Remember that Jesus said, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I am making a place for you. There you will also, uh, there you may also be. Uh, Jesus is preparing for you and me a place in his father's house, and it's the father's desire that the house be filled with sons and daughters. What is, what is it going to be like? What is the new Jerusalem going to be like? The city that never sleeps, the city that is filled with light. You can hear the heart of the father. He wants to fill his house with those who are rejected. Uh, do you have the same heart? Do we have the same heart? Do you have a burning desire to have a heart like the father has? Uh, do you want that house filled? So they went out and gathered even more. And then notice he says that those who have rejected me are not going to eat. I right, press pause and read verses 25 through 27 and then press play again. So here you have the whole group of people and Jesus is saying to them, you need to understand that if you're going to follow me, your commitment to me is likely going to disrupt some of the most important relationships that you have in life. Every organization has their symbols. The Muslims have the crescent moon. The Buddhists have the Buddha. The Nazis have the swastika. The Christians, they have the cross. And what was the cross? It was an instrument of death. Christ says that we've got to carry the cross. He's not saying it literally, carry the cross around. Yet, you know, it means that over the course of your life, there are going to be crossroads. And you look at the sweat, uh, the, at, the, uh, uh, at, the, at the, the, uh, the road over on the left, that's an easy, wide uh, road going downhill. And you think, I'd love to live on that road because it's going to make me happy but there's a gnawing sense to you to have nothing to do with that road because it is not part of god's plan for his family god wants me to go to the right when when and when i go to the right i can be i can very well end up displeasing some of the most important people in my life but as a disciple you've got to make a choice 
and I am going to, uh, am I going to please my friends and family or am I going to please God? And so that's the choice you have to make. All right, press pause and read verses 28 to 32 and then press play once again. So you and I, we likely tend to interpret this as a very practical matter. And although there is nothing necessarily wrong with, uh, with, with that, uh, you know, you might have someone who comes to you and says, well, I'm going to build a new house. And you're going to respond, do you actually have the money to build that house? And their response is, well, I have enough money for the foundation. But, you know, sure, uh, uh, they're not sure about the rest of it. And you would like to remind them the words of Jesus, you better count the costs before you start. Otherwise, you're going to look stupid. And so if you don't have the money, I would not start that housing project just yet. And in that context, we uh, are we not counting the costs of becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you understand that coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus is to be an, uh, an analytical decision? Now, what has happened in America is that we have uh, brought into the church um, uh, um, what is known as decisionism, decisionism, which goes back to the father of decisionism, a guy by the name of Charles Finney, lived 1792 to 1875, an American Presbyterian minister. And Finney's view of church was like a courtroom. He viewed himself as an attorney. And as he preached, he was laying out the evidence for the validity of the gospel. He viewed the congregation as being the jury. And after he laid out his evidence, he would then ask for a decision. Who now wants to make a decision for Jesus? Stand up and come forward. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And then we assume that that person came forward. Uh, he uh, was he or she was regenerated, the person was born again or born of the Spirit, and because they have come forward in the church and they, and, they, and they said a prayer, they've been regenerated. Now, what has evolved out of that is uh, that we have very gifted musicians, very gifted singers, very gifted evangelists, and we're able to manipulate the emotions of a crowd and move a crowd in such a way that they can respond uh, in a way which we are hoping for. But the problem uh, that we are now beginning to see as we look at the effectiveness of crusades is that there are, for the most part, uh, dismal failures. In fact, um, Eternity, Eternity Magazine looked at one crusade involving 178 churches where there were 4,106 decisions made, and only 3% of those joined a local church. And the people that study these things tell us that when you see hundreds and even thousands of people coming forward uh, in some of these services, understand that most of them are already Christian, and understand that somewhere between 1 and 5%, three years from then, are still going to be moving forward in their relationship with Jesus. You and I are not doing anyone favors by telling them that if you accept Jesus, that all of your money problems are gonna be solved, all your family problems are gonna be solved. You know, after all, who wouldn't make a choice like that if all of your problems could be solved? Uh, you know, sign me up for that. And then they, they come to Christ, their life for the most part doesn't change. In fact, it probably gets a little bit uh, more challenging because of their faith. And what happens is they want to jump ship. Notice Jesus tells us that uh, you really end up looking like an idiot. Now, Christ is saying that there is to be an analytical process through thought. Do you understand what a disciple is? A disciple is one who will follow the will of God uh, under whatever the cost, no matter what the offense might come to a, to a friend or foe, you're willing to pay that price. All right, press pause, read verse 33, and then press play once again. Now it is three times 
He said, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus without absolute devotion. You can be a Baptist, you can be a Christian, sorry, a, a Catholic, or you can be a Jew, but you cannot be a disciple unless you are all in. What kind of relationship do you think you could have with a lover if your lover is not absolutely devoted to your relationship? Someone who puts their own feelings and concerns ahead of the relationship, someone who wants to please everyone else in your family ahead of your relationship with your partner, who would not take offense to that? And so w would not Jesus be offended with you or me if we were not all in? And, uh, and so uh, that's what he's talking about. Press pause now and read verses 34 and 35 and press play once again. So salt was very important back in the first century. You and I, we rarely think about salt, you know, unless you have blood pressure problems. This culture, they they uh, they thought that salt about salt all the time because it was used for preservation of food. Uh, he's saying to his people that we serve as a force in the world like salt to be an antiseptic. We are to be purifying agent. We are to be looking out for the downtrodden, building schools, building hospitals, building orphanages. And Jesus is saying not to lose the saltiness because if we lose our saltiness, we're going to be in big trouble. Uh, Dwight Pentecost said that there are three steps to discipleship. The first is the curious. And that's where we all begin. We all begin with, well, I wonder what the Bible uh, things are all about. I wonder what that Jesus thing is all about. And then we move eventually to number two, the convinced. I'm convinced that the history of Jesus is true. But that being uh, convinced, uh, we, are, we are convinced we are on the right track. But where Christ wants us is in the realm of number three, which is the committed. The committed lives, I have one goal in life, and that is to please the Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what the fallout might be. What Jesus is saying here, that you and I, we are to endure. It does not matter what, what is lost. It does not matter the heartache. Uh, Christ is looking for absolute devotion. And again, why are we devoted to Jesus? because he is devoted to you and me. Why do we love him? Because he loved us first. Jesus founded his empire upon love. And again, love is not an emotion. It's a verb. It's an action word, doing for others, serving others, making other people's lives uh, uh, more meaningful, making other lives easier. Uh, the lives... Um, uh, we, we, uh, we, as the committed, live our lives with Jesus ruling as supreme. If Jesus is not ruling supreme in your life, you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying it. Jesus is saying it. He is saying it three times here. And may we, may be, may we be found to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope this has been helpful and informative. Our next study will be uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Uh, if you know anyone who would benefit from this Bible study, feel free to share this video. Again, thank you for watching and good day.